Well, maybe there's some assurance, reassurance in that. Uh, I, I'm on the sort of data protection conference circuit, and uh, I remember going to the International Privacy Commissioner's conferences each year for many years, and hearing these wonderful pious to the protective power of the Fourth Amendment from United States representatives to this international audience with the clear implication that this protective embrace of the Fourth Amendment must apply to the world. It turns out it doesn't. And I'll come back to that later. So what was, I think, really significant about 1881A is it combined three elements for the first time, which had been there in separate pieces of legislation, but it brought them together for the first time. Firstly, as we've mentioned, it only targets, well, only targets the rest of the world. But what I don't think anybody noticed, uh, perhaps until I started talking about it two years ago, is they slipped in three words, remote computing services. So whereas previously, all of the previous sort of legislation Pfizer applied to telecommunications companies and internet service providers, this meant that any kind of public cloud computing, or what we would today call cloud computing, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, this was also covered. And people providing those services, not necessarily telecommunications, also had to comply with this. Thirdly, uh, from the original Pfizer definitions, we have this potential cover for what I would call purely political surveillance, unrelated to criminality or terrorism, really people just doing ordinary, lawful, democratic stuff in their own countries. So you could say that this is designed for mass surveillance of any cloud data relating to US foreign policy, and there is this, what I would call, a double, dis sorry, a double discrimination by nationality. You remember the Pfizer definition, sorry, the foreign intelligence information definition discriminated by nationality with that necessary versus relates. And the extra discrimination is this law is aimed at the rest of the world. And bluntly, this is completely unlawful and incompatible with the European Convention of Human Rights. When you look at the jurisprudence on even national security surveillance in the European Court of Human Rights going back 25 years, basically, you cannot discriminate by nationality. You cannot say that somebody of this nationality has some human rights to privacy and this other person, by, by, just by virtue of their nationality, has a, has, a, has a different and, as we'll see, drastically different set of rights. You just can't be done. Now, the precise interplay between jurisdiction, international treaties, does each ECHR apply to the EU or to, to, to member states? Very complicated, and I'll try and say some more about that later. So the Fourth Amendment, turns out, it doesn't apply to non-US persons outside the US. And the history of this is, is kind of interesting. Uh, it's a pretty recent doctrine. Um, if the Fourth Amendment, by the way, you can see that there, I hope it's not too small, but this is the famous right to be protected against unreasonable searches without a warrant. And in fact, it goes back to English common law, uh, a case called Entick versus Carrington, 1765, when the king's messenger broke down the door of somebody who'd annoyed the king with a pamphlet, and then at common law, a judge held that this should not be done without a warrant. And then this became really a, a very celebrated issue during the American Revolution, because British troops were going down, knocking down people's doors without a warrant. So when they achieved independence, one of the first things they wanted to ensure was that their system of law meant this could not be done in future unless warrants had been issued. But there is a huge, sprawling mass of law papers and jurisdiction elaborating what the Fourth Amendment has meant subsequently. But there is nothing in the text which says this should not apply, or rather should only apply, to US citizens. It was only in the Supreme Court case in 1990 that the Supreme Court held that if you are not a US person, you're outside the US, tough luck, you can be searched without a warrant. And moving forward, uh, as it were, on the tail of the warrantless wiretapping affair, there was a case uh, at the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of Review, a special secret appeal court for Fisk, um, and that opinion was, was published in redact heavily redacted form, but in one of the parts that wasn't redacted, it said, there is no Fourth Amendment protection for foreign powers reasonably believed to be located outside the US. And indeed, if you compare Section 81A with adjacent sections which can target US persons, 
there are references in those adjacent sections to the probable cause. In other words, a kind of 50% likelihood that this person is guilty of what you think they're guilty of. But that's absent in 1881A. And then going further forward, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union managed to extract, uh, in redacted form again, an FBI training manual on the use of Section 702. And there, in the non-redacted portion, you find probable cause <coughs> becomes a reasonable belief that your person concerned is not a US person located outside the US. In other words, you've transformed a criterion of suspicion into a criterion of nationality. So, uh, I became aware of the, of the FISA 1881 problem um, round about 2009, when in fact my job in Microsoft was to effectively strategize how I could come up with arguments for my national technology officers to say that cloud computing is safe for your people and your governments to use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was not a happy bunny. Um, and uh, maybe I'll come back to some of the stuff I did inside Microsoft. But anyway, when I left Microsoft in August 2011, I decided that I really wanted to, uh, to, to bring this to public attention. So uh, sort of pursuing these researches and documenting uh, what you see, with, uh, with some academic colleagues, we produced a report for the European Parliament, which was published in November uh, 2012 and received um, a reaction of absolutely nothing at all. It sat on the European Parliament website for one month in plain view of search engines. Nobody knew it existed. So I was sort of sitting at home over Christmas, rather fed up about this, because I was watching on C-SPAN over between Christmas and New Year, the renewal of Pfizer 1881A. It had come up for its expiry, it was being renewed, so when did they choose to renew it? Obviously, they had the debate over the Christmas holidays. <laughs> And uh, the, some senators, you know, put up a very good civil liberties battle about this, but essentially nobody mentioned, as they ever do, you know, what, what, what happens to the rest of the world's rights in this. It was all about the, it's, if you like, the incidental impact on Americans. So I decided to try and call some journalists, and then uh, <coughs> Ryan Gallagher of Slate wrote a very tight 800-word and accurate article. And then the story, I wouldn't say exploded, but it began to get some coverage. And... I found I also had to uh, basically go to the French press and the German press to get them to publish the story because, frankly, when I called up the UK media, they weren't interested. And, of course, the American media weren't interested at all. Um, but as a result of that coverage, there were 1,500 tweets in the week, most apparently from Europe, but the, the general reaction was, you know, how can this be possible? What is our data protection law for if it doesn't protect us from foreign governments doing political spying on our data. Surely, somehow, that's got to be one of the things that data protection law takes care of. The US blog reaction was much less, but it was one self-described civil libertarian blogger said, ha, huh, yeah, well, I guess uh, for the rest of the world, I can sort of see that might be troubling for them, but who's going to stop us? So meanwhile, in, uh, in Europe, as you've probably noticed, for the past year or two, um, there has been you know, an enormous uh, build-up of, for those data protection nerds and lobbyists, a build-up of uh, interest towards legislation happening right now in Brussels on the new data protection regulation, which is replacing the last European Data Protection Directive from 1995. And cloud computing is an enormous part of this debate. And really starting from... 2008, 2009, if you like, on my watch in Microsoft, I could see the US IT industry mobilizing to lobby in Brussels to manufacture arguments about don't worry, be happy about the cloud. And the general structure of the argument is always the same. The general structure of the argument is that US law offers good protection for its citizens through the Fourth Amendment, as good or better as foreign law for foreigners in their country. Ergo, don't worry about US law, do us cloud. Now I can hope you can all see the fallacy in that argument. Because FISA means that you have zero protection for your data in US clouds. Literally zero. And I'll come back to how little that is or what doesn't apply. 
Meanwhile, a whole bunch of different reports uh, have been commissioned. NISA had a report, the World Trade Organization, RAND Europe wrote a report for the European Commission. Uh, Queen Mary University London, with some very distinguished academics uh, in a project sponsored by Microsoft, uh, wrote a number of excellent analytical papers. Uh, Peter Hustings, the European Data Protection Supervisor, uh, made a major speech about this and talked about streamlining the use of binding corporate rules, which I'll come back to later, for, for cloud computing, link laters, uh, and then a law firm called Hogan Lovells, um, that I could say some more about, but I won't. Um, and then on the official US mission to the EU site, various documents exploding myths about the Patriot Act or uh, other bits of legislation. None of these reports during this period mentioned FISA at all. This is a speech given by uh, US Ambassador Kennard to the EU uh, on December 4th last year. And you can see evidence of very powerful wordsmithing there because, again, by this stage, nobody was talking about FISA still. The things that he says are okay and are not going to happen are, in fact, not okay and are happening because of FISA. Uh, it's, frankly, an exercise in very deceptive drafting. 